Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this lesson is part of a series entitled The Book of the Beginning. It's, this is lesson number four in that series for April 23 of 2022 entitled The Flood. Oh dear. Well, there's lots of things that are discussed about the flood, lots of different ideas that people have about the flood. Let's see what we can learn in this lesson. Shall we pray? Father, we have come here today to discuss these issues and try to gather some truths as far as possible from what the scriptures and, and the inspired records give us. May we understand them clearly as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. In the story of the flood, we have almost an undoing of the days of creation week. During the creation story recorded in Genesis 1, God looked down and he was happy at the good that he had produced each day. However, in Noah's day, God looked down and he was sorry because of the world was the world was full of evil. Jim? Genesis chapter 5, verses 5 to 8. Six, Genesis. Excuse me, verses 6 to 8. I'm sorry. Chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 to 8. There we go. When the Lord saw that the wick, how wicked everyone on earth was and how evil their thoughts were all the time, he was sorry that he had ever made them and put them on the earth. He was so filled with regret that he said, I will wipe out these people I have created and also the animals and the birds because I am sorry that I made them. But the Lord was pleased with Noah, Abraham, American Bible Society. The Good News Translation. Good News Translation. However, even in that time of disaster, we notice that God brought in hope despite the disaster. The name of Noah, which means comfort, and it has some other implications as well, as we'll see later in the lesson, is almost as a response to the word sorrow that God felt as he looked down on this earth. So he's sorrow he's made, sorry he's made the word this world, but he looks at Noah and he's comforted. The, the flood was a rescue operation. If God had not sent the flood, it would have not have been long before not one person on earth would have been listening to God. Uh, Genesis, Genesis 6, 8 to 10 and 7, 1, we'll look at these in a moment, which state that only Noah was faithful to God. If we believe that God has foreknowledge, then he knew in advance exactly what the conditions of this earth would be. So in what sense was he sorry? He was sorry even when he created Lucifer in heaven because he knew what Lucifer would do. Now, a lot of people would have a big problem with that, but that's my personal belief. God's, and this is why, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain why. God's government is based on freedom. Love is not possible without freedom. God does not create robots. He gives each of his creatures the freedom to choose. But he knew that sooner or later, someone would choose to exercise his or her freedom to rebel against God. When Lucifer rebelled in heaven, and that story is in Revelation 12, verses 7 to 10, there was war, a war of ideas, not a war with physical weapons. I mean, what weapons would you try to use to depose God? Satan and his followers were cast out of heaven. Why weren't Satan and his followers just eliminated at that point? Kerry? God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers as easily as one can cast a pebble to the earth. But he did not do this. Rebellion was not to be overcome by force. Compelling power is found only under Satan's government. The Lord's principles are not of this order. His authority rests upon goodness, mercy, and love. And the presentation of these principles is the means to be used. God's government is moral, and truth and love are to be the prevailing power. It was God's purpose to place things on an eternal basis of security, 
And in the councils of heaven it was decided that time must be given for Satan to develop the principles which were the foundation of his system of government. So let me interrupt here for a second. <clears throat> what we see now is in his rebellion, Satan is wanting to set up a competing form of government, okay? He had claimed that these were superior to God's principles. Time was given for the working of Satan's principles that they might be seen by the heavenly universe. So, let me interrupt for a minute. So, yeah. who do you think was convincing who of this? Who was convincing whom? Was God convincing the rest of the universe that we needed to give Satan time? Or was the rest of the universe convincing God that Satan had to get get more time to no, work out his principles. It was God, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So this this is a way of saying God l probably led the discussion to for everyone to decide. Yeah, that's the way it should be. Yeah, we need to let s Satan's principles, Lucifer's principles, mature. Well, he w he was convincing enough that a third of the angels believed him. And, and, the a, two th and a lot more were not convinced that God was right. Yeah, well, at least they, they were staying on God's side, but they weren't completely sure. So we got a lot of challenges going on here. Yeah. Go ahead. Satan led men into sin, and the plan of redemption was put in operation. For 4,000 years, Christ was working for man's uplifting and Satan for his ruin and degradation. And the heavenly universe beheld it all. That's from Mrs. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, 7, 59, 1 through 3. Okay, Gordon, why don't you pick up there? So, shortly after the death of Jesus, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Let me interrupt for a second. I mean, imagine these people in heaven, the angels in heaven specifically, who had, who had been not too sure whether they should follow Satan or whether they should follow God. Now, should we? And now, look at, think, think of the, the final events in, Christ, in Jesus' life here on this earth. And they saw what Satan was doing, they saw what Christ was doing, they saw what the Father was doing. And, and they were convinced to follow God. I mean, there was no question in their mind at that point about who, who was in the right here. Yeah. Go ahead. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he, that is Satan, had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted Whatever attitude he might assume, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts and before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. So I, I think this is saying not that they couldn't listen to Satan or Satan no. couldn't approach them, it's that they, all the being said, I've heard enough from you, Satan. Yeah. Your arguments are worthless. Yeah, exactly. Carrying on, this is uh, still from Desire of Ages. Yet Satan was not then destroyed. The angels did not even then understand all that was in, involved in the great controversy. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, Satan's existence must be continued. For the sake of man, why? L read the next sentence. Yeah. Man, as well as angels, must see the contrast between the prince of light, that is God, and the prince of darkness, that is Satan. He must choose whom he will serve, that is now, man must yeah. choose. Yeah. That's all an education process, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, well, think about this. God, God is fair. He's saying, we have to wait until everybody has had at least some level of evidence on which to make a, make a fair decision. That's really what God is, is saying. Satan has claim, made all these claims, and, and let, let's, let's lay them out here. Let's, let's let Satan do his thing, and then people can make up their minds. Go ahead. Continuing in from Great Controversy. 
in the opening of the great controversy, pardon me, this is from Desire of Ages, yeah. Satan had declared that the law of God could not be obeyed, that justice was inconsistent. Okay, yeah, it, but notice he's, these were Satan's principal arguments. Look at them very clearly. Satan had declared that the law of God, what? Could not be obeyed. Okay, what, number one? That two, that justice was inconsistent with mercy. And three, that the law, that, that should the law be broken, it would be impossible for the sinner to be pardoned. Okay, these are the basic tenets of his arguments against God. Every sin must meet, meet its punishment, urged Satan. And if God should remit the punishment of sin, he would not be a God of truth and justice. When men broke the law of God and defiled his will, defied. Satan defied, defied his will, I'm sorry, defied his will, Satan exalted. It was proved, he declared, that the law could not be obeyed. Man could not be forgiven. That's what Satan said anyway. Mm -hmm. Because he, after his rebellion, had been banished from his heaven, Satan claimed that the human race must be forever shut out from God's favor. God could not be just, he urged, and yet show mercy to the sinner. Wow. Ellen White, Desire of Ages 761, a couple paragraphs there, three paragraphs. Yeah. I'll go ahead. Finally, when God and the city of Jerusalem come down to dwell here, sin must be eliminated, including those who cling to it. Now we're talking at the third coming, at the end of, book of the book of Revelation. This is not an act of arbitrary power on the part of God. The rejectors of his mercy reap that which they have sown. God is the fountain of life, and when one chooses the service of sin, he separates from God, and thus cuts himself off from life. He is alienated from the life of God. Christ says, all they that hate me love death, Ephesians 4.18 and Proverbs 8.36. God gives them existence for a time that they may develop their character and reveal their principles. This accomplished, they receive the results of their own choice. By a life of rebellion, Satan and all who unite with him place themselves so out of harmony with God that his very presence is to them a consuming fire. The glory of him who is love will destroy them. Now, let's think about that for a moment. What what changes in us? Obviously, it's something that changes in us because when we're in line with God, His glory makes, gives us life. But when we're out of harmony with Him, it destroys us. So the changes in us. What, what does sin do to us? It's a, it's, a, it's a kind of mystery. We don't know. I mean, I don't know any place where the Bible or even Ellen White really sort of tries to spell out, okay, is it physiology? Is it what, what happens? Well, here's what she says. At the beginning of the great controversy, the angels did not understand this. Had Satan and his host then been left to reap the full result of their sin, they would have perished. But it would not have been apparent to heavenly beings that this was the inevitable result of sin. A doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds and as evil seed to produce the deadly fruit of sin and woe. So the deadly fruit would be what? More rebellion, right? But not so when the great controversy shall be ended. Then the plan of redemption, having been completed, the character of God is revealed to all created intelligences. The precepts, and of course that's in contrast to whose character? Satan's. Satan's character and his plan of government. The precepts of his law are seen to be perfect and immutable. There, then sin has made manifest its nature, Satan his character. Then the extermination of sin will vindicate God's love and establish his honor before a universe of beings who delight to do his will and whose heart is his law. Well then might the angels rejoice as they looked upon the Savior's cross. For though they did not then understand all, they knew that the destruction of sin and Satan was forever made certain that the redemption of man was assured, and that the universe made eternally secure. So this whole, what we might call sin experiment, what we, what we choose to call the great controversy, is gonna be a one-time event. It's never gonna be necessary for it ever to happen again. 
I have sometimes tried to explain it like this, and maybe you have a better explanation out there, but this is the way I had explained it. If, let's just say a million years from now, God creates another world, and someone in that new world decides to rebel, God is going to, God could say, and I think he would say, sit down here, there's something I think you want to see, you need to see before you decide to rebel. And then he would be able to show them the panoramic view that Revelation talks about of, of sin and its consequences and so forth. If at the end of that, having seen the terrible, disastrous results of sin on this earth and in connection with Satan's rebellion, if they still want to rebel, God could simply turn to us who have been through this experience ourselves and experienced it because all of us will be available there starting from Adam and Eve all the way down to our day. God could turn to us and say, okay, what do you think I should do with this person who wants to rebel? Should we have another great controversy? And we would simply say, just step back. And when God steps back from somebody, what happens to them? They perish. So Christ himself fully comprehended the results of the sacrifice made upon Calvary. To all these he looked forward when upon the cross he cried out, it is finished. Is our of Ages 764, paragraphs 1 through 4. When sin spread to this earth, God knew it was coming. The truth about sin and its result, death, Romans 6.23, must be eternally demonstrated once and for all. It doesn't need to be done twice. It just need, needs to be done very clearly and convincingly once. If God had not eliminated the people in the flood, it would have only been a matter of time before no one on this earth would have been listening to God and it would not have been possible for the rest of the plan of salvation to have been worked out. The record of sin will be preserved in heaven as an eternal safeguard against the reappearance of sin or rebellion. Jim, I think you're in. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in, fall, in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, paragraph 4. Yeah, an eternal safeguard. That's what I was talking about when I gave my suggestions there. What do you think God should have done in face of the terrible deterioration of conditions before the flood? Was the flood a rescue mission? Carrie? Just before the time of the flood, humanity has reached the point of no return. God must intervene with a worldwide flood to preserve a remnant of the human race from complete moral degradation and thus extinction. This adult teacher's Sabbath school Bible study guide, 53. In Genesis 4, <clears throat> we saw the contrast between the righteous actions of Abel and the evil response of Cain. Cain's descendants were called the sons of man, while the sons of Seth were called the sons of God. We talked about that last week. Do you think they ever had family gatherings? What would one of those be like? Have you ever thought about that? Um, well, if you read Genesis 6, 13 through 7, 10, you'll read all about the whole events. We don't have time to do it now, but all the events leading up to the, um, the flood. I'm looking at the clock here. I think we better skip that. While we recognize that ancient Hebrew had a relatively limited vocabulary, it is interesting to note that the word for boat in Genesis 6, 14 is the same Egyptian loan word that is used in Exodus 2, verse 3, for the basket in which baby, jo baby Moses floated. <laughs> same, same boat. A little, little different in size, but both boats. What kind of man was Noah? How did he manage to remain righteous in that environment? In Genesis 6, 14 to 22, God told Noah, build a boat for yourself out of good timber, make rooms in it, and cover it with tar inside and out. Make it 133 meters long, 22 meters wide, and 13 meters high. Make a roof for the boat and leave a space of 44 centimeters between the roof and the sides. Build it with three decks and put a door in the side. 
I am going to send a flood on the earth to destroy every living being. Everything on the earth will die, but I will make a covenant with you. Go into the boat with your wife, your sons and their wives. Take into the boat with you a male and a female of every kind of animal and of every kind of bird in order to keep them alive. Take along all kinds of food for you and for them. Noah did everything that God commanded. Good News Bible. I had the privilege not too long ago of visiting a place in Kentucky where a gentleman has, with a, with a lot of help, has built a boat as close as he can imagine it uh, from the directions in the Bible, the actual size of Noah's boat, and he shows inside there how he believed that all these creatures could be preserved and how they could be fed, etc. It's a very amazing uh, presentation. I would recommend anybody who has an opportunity to go and have a look at that. I once heard an anesthesiologist propose that uh, these animals, to be there for over a year, may have been put to sleep. Hibernation. A hibernation, a long-term hibernation. There's another possibility. Yeah. May have been with nitrous oxide or sevoflurane or some other yeah. anesthetic gas. Well, they have a, I mean, I don't know how, you know, how many animals were there, were there. These people have reproduced uh, animals that they think represent a composite of each group of animals. So there are no animals like that today, but they, they you know, they take several different animals in a group and they say, okay, here, maybe this was the ancestor that has some of the characteristics of all those animals and so forth, so that it's a pretty convincing argument. So dogs and bears are yeah. from the same family. Yeah. Cats and kitty cats and tigers yeah. from the same family. Yeah. So this reminds us that each time God commanded, Noah faithfully obeyed. That's an incredible statement. God gave Noah, the, and this is from Ellen White, God gave Noah the exact dimensions of the ark and explicit directions in regard to its construction and every particular. Human wisdom could not have devised a structure of so great strength and durability. God was the designer and Noah the master builder. Patriarchs and Prophets 92, paragraph 3. And if you, if you visit that boat, I don't know how, much, how close it was to the original one that, that Noah built, but I can tell you, it is impressive. Many people doubt the existence of God's foreknowledge. They either think God does not have foreknowledge or that God's foreknowledge destroys our freedom. Well, here's I, a proposal I would like to suggest, and this is from Dr. Maxwell, and many of you have heard him say this. One of the classic examples of God's foreknowledge is that he told Noah to build an ark with, of a certain size. How did God know that there would not be large numbers of people who wanted to get in? Okay. Hebrews 11, 7. It was faith that made Noah hear God's warnings about things in the future and that he could not see. He obeyed God and built a boat in which he had his family were saved. As a result, the world was condemned and Noah received from God the righteousness that comes by faith. Good News Bible. Does it seem possible that of all the people who lived in the world in those days, only Noah and his family were saved? Dr. Maxwell used to talk about, you know, maybe there was a, a young girl out there that was kind-hearted and she, she saw what was happening there and she watched all this and she wanted to get on the ark, but her parents said, no, no, no. Maybe so. What we do know is this. I can't, I have no idea whether there were young girls who did that kind of stuff in Noah's day. But what I can tell you absolutely is that every person who died in the flood will be raised to life again. They will have a chance to face the, ju the same judgment that you and I face before God, before the heavenly universe. And if they're savable, they will be saved. So, Carrie, Second Peter 2. 5 to 12, <clears throat> pardon me. God did not spare the ancient world, but brought the flood on the world of godless people. The only ones he saved were Noah, who preached righteousness, and seven other people. God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, destroying them with fire, 
and made them an example of what will happen to the godless. He rescued Lot, a good man who was distressed by the immoral conduct of lawless people. That good man lived among them, and day after day he suffered agony as he saw and heard their evil actions. And so the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials and how to keep the wicked under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who follow their filthy bodily lusts and despise God's authority. And that's from the Good News Bible. See also Genesis 6, 9 to 10, 7, 1 and 5. Gordon, you want to pick up there? From uh, Ellen White. For 120 years, Noah proclaimed the message of warning to the antediluvian world, but only a few repented. Some of the carpenters he employed in building the ark believed the message, but died before the flood. Others of Noah's converts backslided. Okay. My dictionary says that there isn't a word like backslided. It's Ellen backslided. White in Review and Herald used that. Some of the other manuscripts put it backslid. <laughs> Okay, so you want to go ahead and read Genesis 7 there? Sure, Genesis 7, 11 to 24 from the Good News Bible. When Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the outlets of the vast body of water beneath the earth burst open. All the floodgates of the sky were opened, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On that same day, Noah and his wife went into the boat with their three, son, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. With them went every kind of animal, domestic and wild, large and small, and every kind of bird, a male and a female of each kind of living being, went into the boat with Noah, as God commanded them. Then the Lord, that is Yahweh, shut the door behind Noah. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. How long was there between the time the door was shut and the rain started falling? From this place, it seems like it's close, but I have from other sources that it was a week, and I don't know where the it's source a week. is. It was a week. Yeah, going on, it, it, it was a week. It's spelled out there. Okay. But, and so, I mean, imagine what was happening during that week. The people outside and the people inside. People outside were laughing at those locked up inside, probably. Yeah. <clears throat> well, and then it started to rain. And you've probably seen all sorts of cartoons. One I saw one time showed it was starting to pour rain, and here were the animal, uh, all the animals lined up, and clear at the end there's the yaks and the zebras, and they one sent it to each other. It says, just our luck, they would take us alphabetically, <laughs> which of course is... In English. <laughs> in English, right. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, carrying on with verse 17, the flood continued for 40 days and the water became deep enough for the boat to float. The water became deeper and the boat drifted on the surface. It became so deep that it covered the highest mountains. It went on rising until it was about seven meters above the tops of the mountains. I'm going to interrupt again for a second. I had the privilege one time of traveling to the southern tip of South America, a place called Patagonia. And there's the tip of, of South America, Patagonia there, then there's a pretty wide gap, and then there's Antarctica. There's nothing else that sticks down that far. And because of the effect of the changing, the sun going around like this, the, 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 as where the sun shines, the air, the air tends to, to rise because of the heat, and where it gets dark, it, it tends to fall. And so, that just the circling of the sun like that produces horrendous winds. You, you walk along a, alongside a, a, a lake down there in Patagonia, and toward the end of the, in the morning, it's not bad because it has, the effects haven't taken place yet. But by the end of the day, you walk, you know, you're 15 or 20 feet from the lake, and it's just soaking you from the water, from the literally water, blowing water up, blowing water out of the lake against you. Just... I couldn't believe it. So imagine the entire world with no, no solid bodies of land, just the winds and everything must have just been, I mean, God obviously protected that boat. I wouldn't have survived. 
I think, it, I think it's a lot of ways it still is. If you get down to where what they used to call and still do, the Roaring Forties, there's a whole lot of nothing down there. And yeah. they don't take big ships down there. Yeah, yeah. It's called the Drake Passage yes. between the tip of South America and yes. Antarctica. And it's vicious sometimes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Sometimes it's the Drake Lake, but sometimes it's, it's vicious. Yeah. Verse 21, every living thing on the earth died, every bird, every animal, and every person, everything on earth that breathed died. The Lord destroyed all living beings on the earth, human beings, animals, and birds. The only ones left were Noah and those who were with him in the boat. The water did not start going down for 150 days. That's from the Good News Bible. So imagine God coming down and closing the door. <laughs> the, in the in the ark, the one we we saw there, the what he thinks is a model of thing, that door is enormous. It must have been very very heavy. But you wonder what stopped it from leaking. Yeah, it must have plugged it up somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Satan himself, who was compelled to remain in the midst of the warring elements, feared for his own existence. He now uttered imprecations against God, charging him with injustice and cruelty. So what has Satan seen here? Satan believed that he was just on the verge of winning the great controversy. He believed that he was just about to get every single human being on his side. And now God sends a flood. There were only seven left. Eight. And, so, and oh, well. Eight. And some questioned whether those yeah. were so righteous. Exactly. Many of the people like Satan blasphemed God, and had they been able, they would have torn him from the throne of power. Patriarchs and Prophets 99, paragraph 3, wow. It is interesting to note that the flood story repeats many of the phrases from the creation story, but with opposite results. Is it possible that the God who created might also destroy? Well, look at some of these interesting verses. Deuteronomy 32, 39, I and I alone am God. No other God is real. I kill and I give life. I wound and I heal and no one can oppose what I do. And Genesis 1, 6 and 7. Then God commanded, let there be a dome to divide the water and to keep it in two separate places. And it was done. So God made a dome and it separated the water under it from the water above. And of course, we know that all of a sudden there wasn't any separation anymore at the time of the flood. And then Genesis 7, 11, which we've already read, when Noah was 600 years old, on the 17th day of the second month, all the outlets of the vast body of water beneath the earth burst open, all the floodgates of the skies were opened. Whew. That must have just been, I mean, I have been, I have lived for many years in the tropics, and many of the rural churches have tin roofs. And when, <laughs> when it starts pouring, you don't even, you don't even think of trying to do anything inside of a church with a tin roof when there's a heavy rain. It's right. just deafening. Yeah. So I, this obviously wasn't a tin roof on the, on the ark, but it must have been pretty horrendous nevertheless. Notice that the waters which were separated at creation rejoined in the flood. The destruction by the flood made it possible for God to recreate on earth in a new way. This is a foretaste of what is going to happen at the end of our world's history after the world is destroyed by fire. Jim? Revelation chapter 21, verse 1. When I saw a new heaven and a new earth, the first heaven and the earth, first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. Good news Bible. Isaiah 65, verse 17. The Lord said, I am making a new earth and a new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. Good News Bible. The only thing that prevents God from coming back right now is the condition of his people. That's us. Yeah. God would have come back long before now if we had been ready. Ellen White spells that out in yeah. considerable detail in the book Evangelism, pages 694 to 697. Carrie? Uh, reading from Genesis chapter 7 verses 22 to 24, everything on earth that breathed died. The Lord, in brackets, Yahweh, destroyed all living beings on the earth, human beings, animals, and birds. 
The only ones left were Noah and those who were with him in the boat. The water did not start going down for 150 days. That's from oh. the Good News Bible. How are we supposed to understand statements like this one suggesting that he, Yahweh himself, destroyed all living beings on the earth? After the massive worldwide flood, this is what it says. In Genesis 8, 1, God had not forgotten Noah and all the animals with him in the boat. He caused a wind to blow and the water started going down. Now, I don't know how you look at this. How much of our world is covered by water now? Three-fourths. About three-quarters. Yeah. It seems, I, I, I don't know, but it just seemed to me that it must have been, God must have raised up lands in some places and let water separate into other places. To have the entire world covered with water, up to 20 feet or something like that, I mean, how? But it raises another fact. They must have had a lot of food on board for those uh, yeah. people and uh, the, the animals and stuff that were left. And that's, that's a lot. It's yeah. comparatively, in, in ways, uh, uh, along with the size of cargo boats we have today. Yeah. Clearly, God had not forgotten Noah. 120 years before the flood began, Noah had been warned. He had been preaching to the people and God helped him build that boat. The expression God remembers or God has not forgotten is used in several places in the Bible, suggesting God's forgiveness and the fulfillment of his promises. After more than a year of being confined to the boat, they were in that boat for more than a year, Noah sent out a raven and a dove to see if there was any dry land nearby. Oh, where are Carrie? Is it your turn, or? I don't mind. I'll take. I'll take it. It's all right. Genesis eight thirteen, when Noah was six hundred and one years old, on the first day of the first month, the water was gone. Noah removed the covering of the boat, looked around, and saw that the ground was getting dry. That's from the Good News Bible. But, but as we as we've already seen, Noah faithfully waited for God to instruct him as to what steps to take next. So Noah wasn't rushing ahead of God, he was being very patient. Yeah. Patriarchs and Prophets uh, says, and he, that is Noah, had entered the ark at God's command. He waited for special directions to depart. At last an angel descended from heaven, opened the massive door, and bade the patriarch and his household go forth upon the earth and take with them every living thing. Patriarchs and Prophets 105. And I wonder, did they have a large ramp or ladder stored away in the boat so that the people and the animals could get out that huge door and down to the ground? I mean, there must have been, I mean, the door, they couldn't have had a door way down there, you know, at the bottom level. The door had to be up somewhere. Otherwise, it would have leaked like something, I would have thought. Finally, God gave them instructions to leave the boat. Genesis 8, 15 to 19, and I'm reading, God said to Noah, go out of the boat with your wife, your sons, and their wives. Take all the birds and animals out with you so that they may reproduce and spread over the earth, over all the earth. So Noah went out of the boat with his wife, his sons, and their wives. All the animals and birds went out of the boat in groups of their own kind. Do you think they really waited to hear that? Or they just figured out, man, the water's down, oh, let's climb out. Did he God give him instruction to climb out of the boat? Well, what's incredible is that Noah has waited patiently, according to the, what we read in the Bible, for God's instructions to take each step. So, I don't know. They waited in the boats yeah. seven days yeah. before the rain started. So we must have had a toilet in there somewhere. <laughs> oh, I mean, yeah. All of this stuff, it's got to have been there. Yeah, they, they you know, they're... <laughs> I don't know what the system was, but uh, the the uh, man who has his boat, he had he he's developed a way the water could be recycled and the way that waste could be dumped, and it's all in there. Yeah. Okay, Genesis six seventeen and eighteen. I am going to send a flood on the earth to destroy every living being. Everything on the earth will die but I will make a covenant with you. Go into the boat with your wife, 
your sons and their wives. Good News Bible, Genesis 6, 17 and 18. Okay, now how many ways and how many times did Noah repeat that message? 120 years. What do you preach for 120 years? Well, it's a changing crowd, so the same thing, day after day, maybe? Well, I don't know about a changing crowd. Pe people are living 900 years and 800 years and so forth, so... But if they didn't... It, if they didn't believe it, they, yeah. they would probably dismiss him as, yeah. as an insane guy. God probably gave him his message for the day. Yeah. One of the effects that was immediately apparent after the flood was a change in God's directions regarding what they could eat. Genesis 9, verses 2 to 4. God said, all the animals, birds, and fish will live in fear of you. They are all placed under your power. Now you can eat them as well as green plants. I give them all to you for food. The one thing you must not eat is meat with blood still in it. I forbid this because the life is in the blood. Okay, good news Bible. Clearly there was no plant life which had grown sufficiently to supply the diet for all the animals as well as the humans at that point. So God allowed them to eat of the clean animals. There were two clear restrictions in God's directions. One, they were only to eat the animals that were described as clean. And by and large, what kind of animals were those? Those are herbivores, right? Yeah. Plant-eating animals. And they were not to eat blood. God had made a covenant with Noah that he would preserve him and his family through the flood. Then he extended that covenant to include a second promise. Jim? Genesis chapter 8, verses 21 to chapter 9, verse 1. The odor of the sacrifice pleased the Lord, and he said to himself, Never again will I put the earth under a curse because of these of what people do. I know that from the time they are young, their thoughts are evil. Never again will I destroy all living beings, as I have done this time. As long as the world exists, there will be a time for planting and a time for harvest. There will always be cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night. God blessed Noah and his sons and said, have, children, excuse me, have many children so that your descendants will, all, excuse me, will live all over the earth. Back up to verse, uh, the, next, the prior verse there, 23. What do we do about global warming? It says yeah. you can have hot and cold, summer and winter, day and night, as long as the earth is going to last. Yeah. Okay. Well, the question I had is, is I was, as you were reading that is, does this mean that Noah and his wife went on having other children? Yeah, well, they didn't write it down anyway. That's like a lot of fun. This promise is even for us as long as this earth exists. There was an entire planet waiting to be repopulated. So God instructed that the animals were to reproduce and increase in numbers, and so were the humans. So this was a reproductive melee, huh? And at that point, God introduced a special sign of his covenant to the world. Carrie? Reading from Genesis chapter 9, eight, verses 8 through 17. God said to Noah and his sons, I am now making my covenant with you and with your descendants and with all living beings, all birds and all animals, everything that came out of the boat with you. With these words I make my covenant with you. I promise that never again will all living beings be destroyed by a flood. Never again will a flood destroy the earth. As a sign of this everlasting covenant, which I am making with you and with all living beings, I am putting my bow in the clouds. It will be the sign of my covenant with the world. Whenever I cover the sky with clouds and the rainbow appears, I will remember my promises, promise to you and to all animals that a flood will never again destroy all living beings. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between me and all living beings on earth. That is the sign of the promise which I am making to all living beings, and that's from the Good News Bible. Yeah. Just we uh, here in California, we don't have rain very often, but this last week, 
there was a time I, my wife and I stepped outside and we were just looking up and there were clouds here and there but there was just a gap and in between there's a little chunk of rainbow yes. <laughs> that the sun was shining through. Within the last several days my wife sent me a picture of a rainbow going from horizon to horizon. Really? Taken in Redlands. So. Wow, very good. At the end of creation week, God gave us the Sabbath, a day in which we should celebrate and worship him. This was intended to be a blessing for all mankind. After the flood, God gave the rainbow as a second sign for the benefit of all humanity. Many years later, in the days of Moses, he reminded Israel that the Sabbath was supposed to be a sign between them and God that they were his true people. Gordon? Exodus 31, 12 to 17 from Good News Bible. The Lord commanded Moses to say to the people of Israel, keep the Sabbath, my day of rest, because it is a sign between you and me for all time to come to show that I, the Lord, have made you my own people. You must keep the day of rest because it is sacred. Whoever does not keep it but works on that day is to be put to death. You have six days in which you are to do your work, but the seventh day is a solemn day of rest dedicated to me. Whoever does any work on that day is to be put to death. I thought that was in Exodus 20, uh, the statement about the Sabbath commandment. It's repeated here in 31. Yeah, yeah verse, verse 16. The people of Israel are to keep this day as a sign of the covenant. It is a permanent sign between the people of Israel and me because I, the Lord, made heaven and earth in six days and on the seventh day I stopped working and rested. In some parts of the world, some places where I have lived and others live, of course, still, when there is heavy rain and sunlight, one can actually see a double rainbow or even a triple rainbow. In New Guinea, in the highlands of New Guinea, I have pictures of a triple rainbow. When you see a rainbow, do you remember God's promise? Is there any question in your mind about whether or not God will destroy the world by a flood ever again? Jesus himself told us that it, as it was in the days of Noah, Matthew 24, 37, Jesus said the coming of the Son of Man will be like what happened in the time of Noah. The sins, and now from Ellen White, the sins, I'm sorry, this is... Uh, this is from Ellen White. Yeah. Okay, from Ellen White. The sins that called for vengeance upon the antediluvian world exist today. The fear of God is banished from the hearts of men, and his law is treated with indifference and contempt. The intense worldliness of that generation is equaled by that of the generation now living. God did not condemn the antediluvians for eating and drinking. Their sin consisted in taking these gifts without gratitude to the giver and debasing themselves by indulging appetite without restraint. It was lawful for them to marry. Marriage was in God's order. It was one of the first institutions which he established. He gave special directions concerning this ordinance, clothing it with sanctity and beauty. But these directions were forgotten and marriage was perverted and made to minister to passion. A similar condition of things exists now. That which is lawful in itself is carried to excess. Fraud and bribery and theft stock unrebuked in high places and in low. The issues of the press team with uh, records of murder. And you know, the, what's the, uh, what's the old... If it bleeds, it leads. If it bleeds, it leads seems to be the motto of the newspapers and the TV stations and so forth. Wow. The spirit of anarchy is permeating all nations and the outbreaks that from time to time excite the horror of the world are but indications of the pent up fires of passion and lawlessness that having once escaped control will fill the earth with woe and desolation. The picture which inspiration has given of the antediluvian world represents too truly the condition to which modern science is fast hastening. So uh, how close do you think we're getting? Quite close. Compared to what was going on back in those days, we, we must be getting very close to that. Yeah. Even now in the present century and in professedly Christian lands, there are crimes daily perpetrated as black and terrible as those for which the old world sinners were destroyed. Patriarchs and Prophets 101 and 102. That was written in 1890. 
Think what, what would she say today? Yeah. Oh, yeah. In what ways is our society and our world like the times before the flood? In what ways is it not like the times before the flood? Wherever you look at it. <laughs> wow. I mean, all I have to do is listen, you know, I, I, I tend to listen to the news when, while I'm eating, and it almost makes you trouble digesting your food. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, there are many people who doubt the truthfulness of a worldwide flood. Of course, if you do not believe that story, you're calling many Bible writers and Jesus himself liars. Are you prepared to do that? Um, many people. This is mine, I guess. Or this year's Gordon. Oh. Many people have questioned the historicity of the biblical story of the flood arguing that such a worldwide event is incompatible with modern scientific views of natural history. I see there's a misspelling there. However, there is a record of a colossal deluge in the collective cultural memories of many peoples far from each other, all over the world, and not only in the ancient in Near East, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece. Flood narratives are found in India, China, among the ancient inhabitants of Ireland, among the Maya peoples of Mesoamerica, Native Americans, ancient peoples of South America and Africa, and even among Aboriginal tribes of Australia. Yeah, yeah. So which parts of the world don't have such stories? Antarctica. Because <laughs> there's no people living there. Oh, the penguins have that story. Maybe they're the ones, right? <laughs> The fact that modern science cannot make sense of the flood phenomenon is not proof that this event never took place. Modern science is, modern science's failure to account for the flood is simply another evidence of the limits of science, especially when dealing with something as supernatural as the Genesis flood. I can tell you there's a science, science guy that lives in, in uh, Texas that's gone all over the world and he, he studies the orientation of certain things in the ground and there is evidence in that that there was a worldwide flood. Just the, the way the, the, I think it's the magnetic forces in the, in the ground. I don't understand all that, but. Do you think God was happy to destroy all the wicked? They were his children. Would you want to destroy your children even if they are persistently misbehaving? Yeah. Jim? The Hebrew word makah, destroy, is present in a, world, in, in a word play with the preceding word nakam, sorry, comfort, which evokes God's sadness and compassion toward humanity through Noah. While Mr. nakam... Let me interrupt for a second. Our Bible study author here just tells us i mean I, I he must i don't know he's just very very fluent with hebrew but there's so many ideas here that you know things that that, that compare because of of just the sound and everything go ahead well nakam suggests the positive face of judgment maka reveals that a negative face furthermore word Excuse me, the word makab belongs to the language of judgment. And it means more precisely to erase. This erasing means a physical destruction that operates in reverse of cre in reversal of creation, undoing God's creative acts. But beyond the physical destruction, this act of judgment also refers to being spiritually erased from the book of life that is from Exodus chapter 32, verses 32 and 33, and Psalms 69, verses 28 and 29. In biblical thinking, love and justice belong together. Micah 6, 8, from the Bible Study Guide, page 54. Okay. Carrie, you want to take up those next couple of verses there? Yeah. Uh, it's Exodus chapter 32. And these, these are, excuse me, interrupt again. These are verses where those same words are used in a different context to help us to understand what they might mean. Okay. 
Exodus 32, verses 32 through 33. Please forgive their sin, but if you won't, then remove my name from the book in which oh. you have written the name of your people. So that remove my name, remove, that means to erase. That's, that's the word. Yeah. The Lord answered, it is those who have sinned against me whose names I will remove from my book. That's there it is again, remove. Yes. Psalm 69, 28 to 29, may their names be erased from the book of the living. May they not be included in the list of your people. But I am in pain and despair. Lift me up, O God, and save me from the Good News Bible. Micah 6, 8, no, the Lord has told us what is good. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, to show constant love, and to live in humble fellowship with our Lord. That's from the Good okay, News Okay, Gordon, Bible. you want to take on the ark there? Uh, from the Bible study guide, how big was the ark? If the cubits equaled 18 inches or 45 centimeters, 300 cubits for the length of the ark would have equaled 450 feet or more than 137 meters. 50 cubits for its width would have equaled 75 feet or 22 meters. And 30 cubits for its height would have equaled 45 feet or 13 meters. These measurements have no special symbolic or spiritual significance. They simply suggest the magnitude of the size of the vessel, which was large enough to accommodate the animals and humans on board. But the many parallels between the ark and the tabernacle carry a profound meaning. The God who saves spiritually, that is Jesus Christ, is the same creator God who saves us physically and materially. Bible study guide, page 55. In sending the flood, was God violating the sixth commandment? The Hebrew word, and here's an interesting explanation, the Hebrew language has several verbs for killing. All these verbs apply to both humans and animals except one, the verb ratzak, which applies only to humans. Significantly, it is the verb ratzak, kill, in different versions, sometimes translated kill, murder, that is used in the Ten Commandments. The nuance of this usage does not differentiate between the case of murder and other cases, but between the object that is killed, humans or animals. Therefore, the sixth commandment should not be translated as, you shall not murder, implying only the specific case of a criminal act, but you shall not kill humans, humans in the absolute sense. So he's saying that that word, you shall not kill humans, it applies to human beings. How should we apply these ideas to military service and similar situations in our day? That's a challenge that we have to deal with and thank you for listening, let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, these lessons are a challenge to realize all the implications of these uh, passages from scripture, the Hebrew, etc., that we are trying to get some idea of. Help us to know as far as possible, what actually went on in the days of Noah and prior to that, after that, help us to understand how you, why you did what you did and how you did it. And may we come to understand you better in your character and your government as a, as a result, as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.